my pleasure uh, today to uh, talk with Dave Patterson out in uh, Dana Point, California. Dave is a chief engineer for certification and regulatory issues of uh, Mitsubishi vehicles. And we are going to talk about the Mitsubishi IMEV. It uh, has been, wow, I think at least eight years, uh, I think since, or pretty close to eight years since it was introduced. I got to drive the fir very, my very first one, and I think actually the only time, at the uh, Tokyo Auto Show in 2007. So there's a lot of ground that's been covered since then, and we'd like to sort of catch up to see uh, where uh, you guys are with the car. So Dave, uh, welcome to EV World. Thanks, Bill. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, you got in 2007, that was one of our prototypes, and we've come a long way since then. <laughs> You've come, well, it was, but it was a fun drive even back then. So, so let's talk about, first of all, let's give us a little history on, uh, on the, uh, the IMAV. Obviously, it's been around for a while. I'm sure it was in development before that, and it was actually, if I remember correctly, it was, ba you took essentially one of the micro cars, uh, and, uh, that had a small gasoline engine in it and made it electric. So sort of give us, set the groundwork for how we got from there to where we are now. Sure, uh, the IMEV is based on our award-winning Mitsubishi I. And that, that was a, a revolutionary mini car at the time. What we did with that car is we moved the wheels out as far as you can. Cars are pretty Spartan vehicles, and we went upscale with this car. We added air conditioning, radios, and things that you didn't find in usual mini cars. And so we took that vehicle, and our guys saw it in the R&D shop, and they started kind of looking at it, and they thought, gee, you know what? Maybe we can do this. Okay. And it wasn't. It wasn't just that way, too. It was also with the technology. The important parts of the technology were the breakthroughs in battle and also uh, motor design. That the electric motors, we got to a point of the weight versus power ratio, the electric motors started to really make sense for, for electric vehicles. That was 2006. So 2007, you saw one of the prototypes in the the uh, Tokyo Auto Show 2008, we actually brought it to the New York Auto 2009, Show. 2009, we introduced the car in Japan. And soon afterwards, in 2010, we introduced the car in Europe. And then in 2012, we introduced the car, a, a version of the car, here in the United States. What we did is we took the original K car from Japan, we widened it and lengthened it a little bit to comply with the U.S. safety standards, and we introduced the North American IMEV. Okay, so now we've got, uh, with production having begun uh, in 2009, in fact, I remember getting an email from a, uh, one of my readers over in Japan who was proud to say he was one of the first people to, uh, to actually buy one, and of course I haven't heard from him since, so you know, Lord only knows what's happened to him and that car, but uh, I, it, it, it's interesting that, uh, you know, you, you guys were one of the first actually out there because we didn't see uh, the competing car in the form of the Leaf uh, until uh, a couple of years later. That's correct, Bill. No matter what Nissan says, we actually were the first ones to mass produce a, a electric vehicle. Right, very good. Okay, so we, we one of the things I got I, pictures to prove it, no less. <laughs> hey, I rode in one. I can prove it too. <laughs> in fact, I probably got pictures someplace from that uh, on this computer uh, from that show. So, um, so the thing that intrigued me about about what you guys were doing is is you really got aggressive with the international sales of this vehicle. I mean, every time I turned around, they were popping up in Italy, in Spain, in Japan, in Singapore, uh, in uh, uh, the, not the Balkans, but in uh, Latvia, and you know, all of these places. How, how, did that, how did that come about? Well, that was part of our, our overall plan, is that, that we weren't just launching this, this, you have to understand that our company is a little different. We actually believe that electric transportation is the future, and we don't believe just a, a buzzword. We don't. We believe this as this is our future plan. It is part of our environmental plan, what we call the 2020 plan. Okay. By the year 2020, 
20% of our book production is going to be electric drive vehicles. And we introduced this vehicle in all of these areas, not because of some government compliance program, but because we truly believe that the future is electric drive. And the reason you also see it in all these different areas all over the world is we made a concerted effort at the beginning of this program during the prototypes to send these prototypes all over the world to gain customer information on what would be a successful electric vehicle. We sent that they weren't just in Japan, they weren't just in the U.S. Heck, that like you just listed off, they went to Iceland, they went to, they, the uh, Prince of Monaco had one, we had them in France, we had them in South America, we had them in Australia, we had them in New Zealand. You know, you, you, we blanketed the world with these vehicles because we wanted to get the customer's input into these vehicles to see maybe this is the fir our first step, but then we want to see what's the step after this. And so what you saw is it, it, this is a global car now. Okay. So let's, let's talk about um, uh, you brought up the thing with France. I noticed that you were doing re the, essentially what was happening is uh, PSA Citroën was actually rebadging some of your vehicles, so they were, you could buy an electric car from Citroen, you could buy an electric car from Peugeot, but they were essentially the cars that, uh, that you guys had introduced. Were you sending those vehicles to them for, uh, for completed assembly? Were they doing any manufacture there? No, they were, I, they were not doing manufacture there, Bill. Okay. They, the, the, we, we've had a long uh, relationship with Peugeot Citroën. Uh, we used to share a plant in the Netherlands. Okay. And we, we were building these on our own production line. Okay, and those were on what, in Japan you were building them? Yes, in, in Japan. Okay, so you were basically building also then uh, right-hand and left-hand drive vehicles because the Peugeot ones would be left-hand drive. That's right. Yep. Yeah, we have... We, this car, you know, it, we all call it the i mean, but there's three versions. Right. There's the, the, the right-hand drive, there's Japanese spec, then there's the left-hand drive Euro spec, and then there's the left-hand drive North American spec. Okay. Um, so how many vehicles have you built up to this point, then, of all of those, those three different specifications? I don't have the, the current figures at my fingertips, but I know it's over 50,000 vehicles. Okay, so you built quite a few. Including all the variants. Okay, I lost that last bit. Uh, it's over 50,000 vehicles, including all the variants. Oh, okay. Like I just said, there's the three variants of the iMeve, but there's also, we have the... Uh, we have a utility truck in, in Japan that's based on the same EV architecture. Oh, okay. So if I were in Japan, I could ha I could buy what a little um, sort of uh, minivan version of this. Yes. Okay. And that's what they for you know plumbers and contractors use in Japan to get their work done, oh. and so they have a EV version. Okay. How many of those have you built? Do you think? Uh, that's all. That's all. That's all built into that fifty thousand. Oh, okay. All right. Great. Well, you know the other thing too is is that what, coming to the United States. Uh, you had an interesting program that you were running, and if I remember correctly, I'm picking up off of memory, you had some kind of a program going on in Indiana where you have your plant, um, and it was what I think normal Indiana, I believe. Sort of what's tell us a little bit about that and what its status is. You're paying attention, but you just missed by one state, Illinois, Bill. Oh, Illinois. I'm sorry. Well, here's Bloom the here, I, I, Illinois. I, I used to actually live near there, so I completely blew it. You're right. It, 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 you, yeah, I know that you're just in the wrong state, Bill, but it's all right. We're friends. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, uh, we're talking about EV Town USA, Bloomington Normal. Uh, Bloomington early, Normal right. early in the program, um, obviously, that's where we have our plants, and so they're very Mitsubishi-centric there. And they were paying attention to our press releases, and we have an EV Town in Japan, and we have a number of different demonstrations in Japan. And so... The, the town of Bloomington Normal was paying attention, and it's a great, great success story. They got in early, and they installed infrastructure. They installed both Level 2 and Chatamo DC Quick Charging infrastructure. 
That and, that and the city itself became engaged in that, and they said that they wanted to they wanted to add the vehicles to their city fleet, which they did. And because of this, the dealer also embraced this vehicle. He embraced this vehicle so completely that he was the number one de de sales dealer in the whole U.S. Not only was he the number one dealer in the whole U.S., but that one dealer sold more than all of our dealers in California combined. Oh, interesting. Huh. And now when you go to Bloomington Normal, just you know, out in the middle of the Corn Belt in Illinois, you see all of these EVs driving around town, sitting there at the Chargers, and these people love them. You know, I went to, an, I went to a, uh, a uh, display, I'll have to call it there, at the convention center. But they had the vehicles there, and we had the, we had the customers. And the customers, they willingly came up to the microphone and professed their love for this vehicle, <laughs> about how much they enjoyed this yeah. vehicle. And this, I can remember this one customer he came up there, and he and his wife were standing up there, and he was saying how much he loved the vehicle, that his wife drew, drove it, and as soon as she drove it, she may go and buy another one for her. How about and that? And I happened to be standing next to the sales manager, and he goes, Dave, you just can't buy this. Yeah. This is, this is, this is, what, this is what we want to hear from our customers. Right. People who drive this vehicle truly love this vehicle. They understand the vehicle. It was never intended to be... You know, every gizmo and gadget in the world, it wasn't all things to all people. What it is, is good, affordable, advanced technology transportation. And that's what it gives our customers. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about that because you obviously you had at least a two-year head start over Nissan. Uh, you've, you've had, you know, these vehicles, uh, like I said... Just about anywhere on the planet, there's got to be at least one of those vehicles, you know, in some city somewhere. Um, so, so why is it? What, what's been, the, in a sense, what's been the hang-up? Why aren't you at two hundred thousand like Nissan with the Leaf? What's what in you? What 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 did you do right, and maybe what haven't you done right? Well, what the, the real big difference there, Bill, is how big our company is. You know, our company is significantly smaller than Nissan. And I have to give Nissan a lot of props, too. Nissan and Carlos Ghosn, they also have embraced EV technology. Yep. And what they did is they threw a massive amount of money behind the, the Nissan Leaf. I mean, massive amount of money. Okay. And that's why you hear and see an uh, uh, ad for a Nissan Leaf on every billboard in Los Angeles when they launched the vehicles. They had them on the size of skyscrapers here. They, they are doing every single thing they can to launch the vehicle. If we had those same resources, we'd probably be in the same position sales-wise. With the amount of resources that we've expended, I, would, I think that proportionally our, we are more successful. Just, you know, when you start looking at it from a world view, it looks like Nissan's wildly successful, but people don't understand that Mitsubishi is significantly smaller than, than Nissan. Okay. All right. Well, that helps explain a little bit then. Um, one of the things that, that, in my view, if I were out looking at the two cars, first of all, one of them obviously is bigger than the other. The Leaf is bigger than the iMeave. Uh, also, there is a difference, in, and that's, I think, also reflected in the range difference because the EPA range on them if I in looking at the currently pro produced EVs that are out there the, the iMeave has the shortest of the range I think it's somewhere around 60 65 miles per charge the uh, Nissan Leaf uh, 78 to 85 or something like that depending on which version of the car you're talking about was it? Do you, do you see that as kind of one of the issues, in pe you know, in people's mind? And and how can you guys address that? We we're seeing evolution in the, in battery technology. Can we expect to see greater range in this car? Well, first of all, it's it, it, just to help you, Bill. It's sixty-two miles for the IME on the the EPA cycle. Right. Uh, the 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 way to look at this though too is. 
It's the I leaf is a significantly smaller car than the leaf. Um, you know, it's a whole segment smaller. Right. But the battery in the I leaf is the battery in the I leaf is almost fifty percent smaller than the battery that's in the leaf. Okay. If you talk about, from an efficiency standpoint, the I leaf is far more efficient than the leaf, or in, or most all the other competition. All the co the other competition have much larger batteries. And that's where it comes into the kind of the, the, the strange game that we're playing here in, here in the U.S. because of the, the, uh, the ZEB mandate, is that the magic number is 100 miles if you're playing the ZEB mandate game. Right. You want to get more than 100 miles, how California counts the numbers. Right. Our car gets 98 miles. Now, if we were playing the Zev, if we were playing the Zev game, we would push that. We would put enough batteries in there to get over a hundred miles. Okay. That's what that's what the competition is doing. Is they're looking for the Zev credits. Right. We're not looking for the Zev credits. We're looking for we're looking and learning how to build a sustainable electric vehicle. Not just this one, but that's why we call it a Meev. It's Mitsubishi Innovative Electric Vehicles. This is our technology group. Okay. The IME is just our first electric vehicle that we're introducing. And that's what that's what we, you know, I think a lot of people are excited about is they saw the IME, they saw the promise of the IME, and now they're seeing some of that pay off with our Outlander PHEV. Right. Which has been which has surprisingly done very, very well in Europe. And I am sure that there are a lot of people <laughs> here in the United States that would like to uh, like to see that show up here as well someday. Well, thank you, Bill. We're we're looking forward to bringing it here to the U.S. Okay, and uh, I assume there's some. Uh, do you have any sense of when that might happen? My soft date for you is uh, is April of 2016. Okay, all right, that's good to know. Um, one of the that's, other better, that's better than the dates that the uh, how confident I've been about prior dates. Let's put it that way. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's your squishy date. It's it's a little squishy, but it's it's much more. You know, we're gonna you're gonna see some announcements based on that date soon. Okay, all right, great. We, we've been we've been doing a lot of design on this car again. It's one of those challenges for us because we are a smaller company. It's harder for us to, to, to commit the amount of resources that are necessary to develop a North American specific model. You know, it, the way that the EPA and ARB have constructed the regulations here in the U.S., it's becoming that way that the U.S. is becoming an island and vehicles have to be designed specifically for the North American market. And then when you start looking at the markets of the world, you look at the European market, you look at the Asian market, and you start seeing that the North American market is no longer the number one car market. And it's one of the things that's challenging for a company of our size. Okay, so you have to sort of prioritize where am I going to get uh, the best sales and where are the best incentives to, you know, to, 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 you know, uh, to help people buy the vehicle and... Uh, uh, you know, from what I know, at least in you know the, how the vehicle is selling in Europe, uh, I can understand why you would have picked that market. 